Good morning, I greet you in the wonderful name of Jesus. Welcome. Those watching online. Um, so while we take up the offering, Pastor Sarah has already prayed for the word actually. Um, we're going to be speaking about how not how not to grieve the Holy Spirit is topics sometimes I would say seldom spoken about. How not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Most people don't realize that the Holy Spirit grieve, it can be grieved rather. Okay, so I'm going to read from Ephesians 4, verse 30. Amplified version, and he says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, but seek to please Him, by whom you were sealed and marked and branded as God's own for the day of redemption, the final deliverance from the consequences of sin. Do not grieve or bring sorrow to the Holy Spirit by the way we live. We need to remember that we are identified by the Holy Spirit as we belong to Him, and He guarantees, as we read, that we are saved on the day of redemption. And the Holy Spirit is a person. Most people somehow they think he's some mystical entity that some way out there. You know when the Lord Jesus was there and all the miracles he performed. Before he went, he says, I'm going. When you pray, ask in my name and it will be given unto you. In fact, he said, ask anything in my name. And it will be given unto you. But then he said, I'm going because I'm not going to be with you here physically. I'm sending one just like me and that's the Holy Spirit. Now that's it. It's that's food for thought because in many a believer's prayer, how often do you even mention the word Holy Spirit? He's a person that God sent. He's not human, but he, it means he has a personality. He has a mind. He has a will. He has emotions, and he loves you enough to be grieved when you are walking in disobedience. It also means that he loves you enough to be pleased by your obedience. He has feelings. Let's put it that way. If you look at the great. Powerful preachers like Benny and Catherine Coleman, and how they talk about grieving the Holy Spirit. It's, the things that we do or we don't do can affect the way the Holy Spirit feels. And when he's affected negatively by, I would say, willing disobedience, it makes him sorrowful. Like you grieve a friend or someone that's close to you. And he pulls back. He doesn't ever leave you, but he pulls back. We can grieve the Holy Spirit when we do or we don't do what he asks us to do. You know, we say, we, God has not given us the spirit of fear. We should fear nothing. If the only thing you should fear is grieving the spirit of God. Not because there's consequences in terms of you'll be punished, but because you are hurting God. And for many believers, this happens when we sometimes try to follow the way of God. It causes um, offense sometimes. The gospel truly spoken will often displease those that are unholy. And if you give in to the ways of the world, you can grieve the Holy Spirit because the opinions of men of this world is often contradictory to what God says. People will come against you when you speak the truth. They'll say you're too holy. Some will attack you when you, when you disrupt things by speaking what the Bible says. Or when you disrupt things by saying what the Holy Spirit says. When you follow the voice of the Holy Spirit, you're going to be a disruptor. Not everyone's going to like you. Jesus, when he walked, they even said Jesus was not of God. And often we can say things that can upset the religious. You're going to say things that upset the culture. The culture might say this is fine, but God says it's not. You won't always be accepted, but that's also okay. When we embrace the way of Christ, we embrace the cross, and that means persecution often. But ultimately, in God's hands, so we should never be afraid. Just afraid, just be fearful, not the word afraid, I would say, of, of hurting God, because he loves you so much. And we should never be, as I said last week, afraid of demonic powers. We should always be vigilant, but never be paranoid. You should be aware of the attacks of the enemy, of his deceptions, that you're in a spiritual battle, not being ignorant of it. I'm not saying we should be apathetic towards the powers of darkness or towards the devil and his demons. 
then the Bible wants that the enemy is prowling around you. But there's a big difference between vigilance and paranoia. Be aware of the war around you, but don't be afraid. Because greater is he that is in you, that he that is no what. And the Holy Spirit is more powerful than any spirit that exists, and he exists and he lives inside you. There is no more there's no spirit that's more powerful. As I said last week, he's not just powerful, he dominates. And when you is in you, and if you allow him, you will also have that spirit of dominance. So don't be afraid of what man can do or what man can say, or of demonic powers. Be aware, but don't be afraid. But be wary of, of grieving or hurting God, the Holy Spirit. Not for fear of punishment. Although there are, there are consequences to sin, and we know that sin has a very destructive power. And even believers will persist in sin will eat the fruit of destruction. But don't fear anything. Just be, you should have a, so much of a love for God that you would not you never want to hurt him. Your fear of grieving the Holy Spirit should be motivated by love. And when you grieve the Holy Spirit, this is the problem. He pulls away from you. And if you used to his presence, you will feel his presence would draw. He might withdraw, as I said, but he never leaves you. Grieving the Holy Spirit is like hurting God. And it's a life of us that we should walk in a way knowing that what you do in the world affects how, how the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, feels towards you. So I'm going to talk to you about things that we do that affect or grieve the Holy Spirit. And one of the things, or the first thing rather, <coughs> excuse me, is doing unholy things. <coughs> excuse me. Sometimes I would term it, I would um, call it, excuse me. Sometimes I would call it um, permissible sins. Where you permit yourself to willingly do things, but you know you should not be doing it. Sins by your own permission. You know it. You say, now and then, it's a Saturday night I can do this, for example. Things that we sometimes do by negligence or indifference. We know we should not do these things. We know that they violate the word of God. We know it's wrong. They violate the nature of God and the instructions that we have been given by the Holy Spirit. And when we do these things that we shouldn't be doing, it grieves the Holy Spirit, it affects his heart. If you look at Ephesians 4, 25 to 32, Yashin, you're going to change that for me. I'm going to read from the 25th verse. This was a, the epistle to the Ephesus church, written by Paul to the believers. And the church was made up of both Jewish people and Gentile people. So there were lots of cultural differences. Sometimes our culture can cause us to come against the precepts of God and we make mistakes. <coughs> Excuse me. Ephesians 4, 25 to 32, it says, So discard, excuse me. <coughs> so discard every form of dishonesty and lying so that you will be known as one who always speaks the truth for we all belong to one another. And don't let the passion of your emotions lead you to sin. Don't let anger control you or be fueled for revenge, not even for one day. Don't give the slanderous accuser the devil an opportunity to manipulate you. If any of one of you has stolen from someone else, never do it again. Instead, be industrious, earning an honest living, and then you will have enough to bless those in need. And never let ugly or hateful words come from your mouth. Instead, let your words become beautiful gifts that encourage others. Do this by speaking words of grace to help them. The Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, has sealed you in Christ Jesus until you experience your full salvation. So never grieve the Holy Spirit of God or take for granted his holy influence in your life. Lay aside bitter words, temper tantrums, revenge, profanity, and insults, but instead be kind and affectionate towards one another. As God graciously forgiven you, then graciously forgive one another in the depths of Christ's love. <coughs> the Bible is speaking about dishonesty and lies. No one's perfect, but uh, sometimes we give in to that. We might give in for convenience. It's just easier. It might make a business deal make, become sweeter. It might make this better, in your opinion. 
But the Bible says when you lie or there's dishonesty, even talks about stealing as we read. It grieves the Holy Spirit and he goes away from you. He pulls back and without, you don't ever want to be without his influence around you. So he's guiding and leading. Anger and revenge. People sometimes will go <coughs> out of the way to make you angry. So you just seek revenge. How do you deal with people that express so much of anger against you or seek revenge? The worst thing is to do it yourself or retaliate the same way. Not blessing those in need, as the Bible speaks about, hateful or ugly words. I've heard Christians sometimes speak. And sometimes you don't even know by the words that they speak whether they know God. Prof profane language that comes out. The moment you are profane, speaking words like that, the Holy Spirit is going to withdraw from you. It's going to go. There's a sermon that I want to preach in the future called it speaking about how the Holy Spirit can hide. Be with you, never leave you when you are become that way. Temper, tan temper tantrums, seeking revenge, just bursting out and flaring up, saying whatever you please. I had this friend years ago that um, when I first met him, I was not even a believer. I used to travel with him to work. But I knew where the area I come from, Chatsford, the man would be in church every possible time that we walked. We walked a lot, you know. I used to wonder what is what I used to say, well, I don't know what his problem. Always going to church. You know, if he's working, what is wrong with him? But eventually, uh, God blessed him, and uh, though he wasn't a very, um, uh, for lack of a better description, a very intelligent man, but he was very faithful to God. And uh, suffice it to say, after the next time I met him, because we had gone our separate directions and he was working some hours. Years later, when I met him, he was a multimillionaire. And I took this man who didn't have much in terms of worldly knowledge, blessed him with supernatural knowledge, and he had started up a shipping company. It's been very, very well. And, uh, <coughs> and he became very blessed. One day I was sitting at his place and he would be fasting every year. He had lots of workers and in panel beaches and things like that. If he had car sales, whatever. And one of them would make him so cross. And the words that would come out of his mouth would shock me. And he would, would say, you see, I've been fasting and you guys made me do that. When you do that, whenever you become profane and speak words like that, the Holy Spirit would draw. The moment you say or do anything that grieves the Holy Spirit, you feel it. You'll know it. You feel remorse within. So watch how you speak, how you behave, how you act. And most of us, well, all of us have the Holy Spirit within us. Most of us will feel when we do something wrong. So guard against things that we should not be doing. Guard against lies and speaking badly against people. It affects the Holy Spirit and it withdraws. Those things we know are wrong, but we give ourselves permission to do. And remember, for those of us uh, that have children, <clears throat> they learn from what you do, what you do. They do more. They learn from what you, your behavior rather than your instruction. They do what you do rather than what you tell them to do. I've seen this. You see a child that grows up and you will know how the parents are. So what you do is going to affect them also. Guard against speaking in any way that is unholy, even in your words, that it be seasoned. When people hear you, they must see something special. Not one day see a demon, the next day, this man going to church. Guard against sins that you give yourself permission to do. The next thing is sins of omission, as we call it, which is not doing things that the Holy Spirit tells you to do. Sometimes it's self-explanatory. When you know you see a person that needs help <clears throat> and you are able to help them, it's a poor person or whatever the case, but you really don't do it. Self-explanatory. Sometimes if it's not. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we don't do what he's telling us to do. Now your first response, any one of us, or resource when you want to know or want to do something and you're not sure exactly which way to go, is pray and read the word. Because the Lord will speak in my opinion, my estimate, 
80% of the time that God speaks to you, he will speak through his word. Because remember, his word is his word. 80% of the time God speaks, <clears throat> he speaks through his word. How often do you encounter a prophet? Excuse me. How often do you encounter a prophet that will speak into your life? The whole Bible is God's voice. And whatever you do must never contradict his word. You can never do good by mixing in bad. For example, <clears throat> it's like something like a Robin Hood style where you rob a poor a rich man. And you say, I'm going to take this money and bless the poor. So I'm justified. It doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. I've seen people do that. They make crooked business deals. Oh, but I'm blessing the church. I'm blessing the poor. That's not what you don't mix good with bad. Now, the Holy Spirit will, will guide you to do good using the Word of God. Like, for example, in helping someone, a poor, the orphan, or the widow, or a certain ministry. But often in your life, it will speak special instructions to you that relate to your life or your situation or the people that you meet. And when He speaks to you to do something, and you know it's him, you must comply. And when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, he lives inside you. Often he will speak into your mind. It will present itself as a thought that okay. came. Now, the next thing you should, most of you at this point should be asking or saying, <clears throat> that's well and good. But how do we hear? And that's next week's sermon. I do repeat it the other way around. Um, how do you hear? How do you gain discernment to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit? How do you know it's him that's speaking to you? Because sometimes you can go wrong. Most often he will speak through the word. So if you're reading the word every day, you're getting something from the Holy Spirit. But in your personal situation about what we should be doing in a particular area or a decision, he will present it or he will speak into your mind like a thought. For me, often it will come as a thought. It will remind me of an incident that happened 20 years ago. I totally forgotten that I know it's the Holy Spirit. But we have to be careful with this because the Holy Spirit will speak like a thought in your head. Because sometimes, or some people have the tendency to take every thought as an instruction from the Holy Spirit. You need to be wary of this. As I said, we'll talk more next week about designing the voice of the Holy Spirit. I sometimes believe I suffer with this problem. They are constantly obsessing over various things, thinking that the Holy Spirit is telling them to do. And sometimes they're even silly. And often it's not even him. Go and stand outside for five minutes on the road and don't move. Wear that blue shirt, not the red shirt. Go to the shop and look for someone who looks like this. Sometimes it's the Holy Spirit. It may. But many times it's not. The ability to discern the voice of the Holy Spirit will speak about next week, but it's not a skill to be acquired, it's an ability to be developed. It's inside all of you. But nevertheless, when you receive an instruction from the Holy Spirit, our job is to obey. <clears throat> so we spoke about the things that we don't do that can grieve him, the things that we do that can grieve him. There are things that when he tells us, they also grieve him, especially when it's no one is clear cut. For example, he says, help that ministry out there. Or he says, witness to that person. Sometimes, you know, when, you would, when, when God convicts you to speak to someone about Jesus or just about, you don't know what to say. You see this person having a problem. Trust God to put the words in your mouth. Sometimes just your testimony or just encouragement makes a difference. But when we refuse, it grieves the Holy Spirit because sometimes mm -hmm. you may be the only person that God has chosen to speak to that person. And they will never meet someone that can get through to them. When he says to go and do this, and we refuse, do this kind act. When he calls you to pray, and you don't, or read the word, and you refuse. These are sins of omission. He grieves the Holy Spirit. In short, don't neglect being good. Which is doing good, saying good, thinking good. God reads your mind. I think over the last month I've seen this so many times. I would think things and I would find this. I'd open the Bible and, and there'll be a scripture that's talking to me. I would think things and see the answer. God reads your mind. 
So watch when the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. And every one of us here, even children have the ability. I think sometimes they're more, they're more open because they don't restrict themselves as we as adults do. Every one of us, God is speaking to you in some way. How often have you said, I don't know why I've done this. I felt I should go and do this. Or when you read a word, or when you pray, something comes and you know, hey, this is God. So look for how to do good and not bad. Anything bad, not always good. That's no matter what anyone says. The Bible is perfect and God is perfect. When God speaks, listen and do what he says in your particular situation. God will use the Bible, the word is said more times than he speaks. In fact, the Holy Spirit, we're going to speak about it in next week's sermon, speaks to you all the time. The Holy Spirit speaks all the time to you. Not partly, not sometimes. The Holy Spirit is speaking and speaking and speaking all the time. All the time the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Continuously. But the ability to discern his voice. He's constantly there, but he's rarely acknowledged by many. Now consider yourself and think of how you pray. You know, many will start off and say, Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Then they pray, they worship God, they ask, they intercede, and then they close in the name of Jesus. They come to you in Jesus' name, they pray, worship, ask, intercede, and then close in Jesus' name. Now that's all well and good. But many of them don't even mention the Holy Spirit, let alone acknowledge him. Remember Jesus said when he ascended, I'm going and I will come back, but once I go, the Holy Spirit is here, the Spirit of Jesus. Now at this time, Jesus is in heaven. <clears throat> the Father is in heaven. Jesus is sitting next to him. But the Holy Spirit is here or not. Look at him as being the constant companion, your personal companion. When we say Jesus is your personal saviour, it's because you have a personal relationship with Jesus. You talk and pray with him directly, and he hears as you speak to him. The Holy Spirit of the Spirit of Jesus is your personal helper, your motivator, your protector, your comforter, your counselor. He's always with you. And I think one of the biggest revelations I had when I realized that the Holy Spirit is watching everything, he's always with you. Don't go through your life in such a busy pace that you can't acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit. And don't live your life in such a way that you're not aware of his nearness. He abides all around us. Be aware of the Holy Spirit, don't ignore him. Ignoring the Holy Spirit and you are grieving him and you're depriving your life of accessing the greatest power who is standing by you, waiting to guide you and help you. Every big, big revival of God, like for example, the Azusa Street, Every big revival of God, like the Azusa Street Revival, the Brownsville Revival, the Toronto Blessing, etc. They only happen because of the Holy Spirit. Every miracle that ever happened, happened because of the Holy Spirit, because He lives inside you and don't, even, don't ever ignore Him. You. you should be talking to Him all the time about everything. You know, we often say, that the, seek the counsel of God before you make a decision. How do you do that? You do it through the Holy Spirit. Your word should be, for example, Father, I come to you in Jesus. There might need direction from you, Lord. Teach me, Lord. Show me. Guide me. What do I do in a situation? Or what? In fact, your word should be not what do I do in the situation. What do you want me to do? Seeking the word of God. Because he's always right there with you. When you're facing a crossroads, he has an answer waiting for you. Ask him. Ask and you will receive. Now, he's a gentleman. He will never intrude or force his will upon you. Now, there's a big difference when a person is not um, led by the Holy Spirit. They'll make mistakes. Now, remember, none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. We all make mistakes. But the Holy Spirit will guide you, convict you. He doesn't interfere with your free will. You know, I suppose the biggest danger to you or to any one of us <coughs> about ignoring the Holy Spirit would be the cessation of your miracle. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 19, it says, Do not quench, subdue, or be unresponsive to the working or the guidance of the Holy Spirit. If you look at the meaning of quench, <clears throat> as put out or stop, like quenching a fire with water, 
I'll give you an example. You've been praying many days for a miracle to happen. And while still in prayer, and you are seeking God, a man knocks on your door, and God has sent the answer through that man. Now you open the door in absolute irritation, and you shout at him for disturbing you, and you slam the door on his face, and you go back to praying. Now the Holy Spirit was right there. God sent him. He brought you the answer. You ignored the Holy Spirit, and you missed the miracle. You can unwittingly miss your breakthrough by ignoring the Holy Spirit. Always, always acknowledge it. The next thing about grieving the Holy Spirit is division in his body. There are sometimes we need to divide. Division in the early church called growth. But divisions among believers will grieve the Holy Spirit. There is one Holy Spirit only. He lives in me and he lives in you. He's the spirit of truth and he's never double-minded. When two believers argue for whatever reason, and that happens. People, even though they may be holy, may not always get on. And people sometimes they don't get on. Sometimes they spiritualize their actions by saying, I don't, or something in my spirit doesn't agree with you. Most times it's not even that. It's because they've had a disagreement, they just didn't like the person. And that's not maturity. In fact, our unity can only come in proportion to our maturity. Now, I'm not saying we embrace false teachers or lies or deceit. But I'm saying true brothers and sisters in Christ will sometimes upset us. They will disagree with us. They might offend us. But because none of us are perfect, and we all make mistakes often, we can make mistakes. When we allow this division to cause bitterness and cause us to separate, it grieves the Holy Spirit. And that is not biblical. That's when we grieve the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit in me <clears throat> is the same Holy Spirit in you. He has joined us to the Lord in one spirit with him. We are one with the Holy Spirit. With the Holy Spirit, we are one. We are one body. And when there's bickering and fighting, and we carry bitterness, it grieves the Holy Spirit. And division is one of them. When we grieve the Holy Spirit with sins of permission, as we said, we grieve the Holy Spirit with sins of omission. When we ignore Him, when we allow division. And lastly, we grieve, grieve the Holy Spirit with our lack of faith. You know, the Bible says, without faith it is impossible to please God. When we lack faith, we live in fear. We grieve the Holy Spirit because we are saying to the Holy Spirit, I don't really trust you. I'm relying more on my ability than on yours. That's the lack of faith that grieves the Holy Spirit. As much as faith pleases God, then the lack of faith will just please God. Now, as we go through many ups and downs in our lives, remember trials and persecution strengthen you. But always through with all the Holy Spirit is with you. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. He's always there. Once you acknowledge his presence, not just in your heart, but verbally, then it's easier to say because he speaks and you listen and he makes things bearable. As said during a trial, the objective is to teach you something so God won't just end your trial. If you're going through a trial, God will not end the trial to make you feel better. When you feel it's too much and you can't bear it anymore, the Holy Spirit will send you. Now God says, I will never allow you more than you can handle. But it's God, the Holy Spirit. He's all-powerful, he's almighty. Is everywhere all the time, and the best part is on your side. He's always speaking to you. But we need to learn to discern the voice of the Holy Spirit. As I said, it's not a skill to be learned, but an ability to be developed because He lives inside you. The Holy Spirit lives inside you. So He's always speaking to you. We just need to develop the, develop the ability to hear Him. It's not like something. A skill now. I need to now ask God to show me how it's there. It's always speaking. So in terms of grieving the Holy Spirit, the Lord has been speaking much about things that we do that grieve him. Things that we don't do when he tells us to do it. That grieve him. Division, as I said, grieves him. Ignoring him, saying, oh. having no faith in saying, I don't know. Having no faith is not trusting the Lord. So as we close in prayer, this is my word, Father, we thank you for your words that has come forth, O Lord. My precious Holy Spirit, you are always with us. You never leave us. You never forsake us. You're always with us, Holy Spirit. You never leave us, Holy Spirit. Always with us. 
and we thank you. <clears throat> and though we falter and we fail in so many ways, you are always there. I thank you, Holy Spirit. You're always with us. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for guiding us and protecting us and leading us, for convicting us when we go wrong, for showing us the way. I thank you, precious Holy Spirit. You never leave us. You never forsake us. I thank you, mighty Father, for your hand upon us. And I thank you, Holy Spirit. I pray that you would convict us. Your word says, Lord, that we all fall short. We always falter. We fail. We make mistakes. Show us, O oh Lord, that we may realize when we hurt you, that we may walk with hearts of repentance, O oh Lord. I thank you, wonderful Father, and I pray, O oh Lord, of all your children, that the Lord may bless you and the Lord may keep you and the Lord may protect you and sustain you and the Lord may guard you. And God may make his face to shine upon you with divine favor, be gracious to you, surrounding you with loving kindness. And the Lord may lift up his countenance upon you with divine approval and give you shalom, a tranquil heart and life. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace, your precious grace, your grace your grace, O oh Lord. Father in heaven, we thank you for your wonderful, wonderful love and precious Holy Spirit. We thank you for your fellowship that you're always with us. Thank you, wonderful Father. I thank you for the blood of Jesus that covers us and protects us and keeps us and sustains us and justifies us and delivers us. Thank you, wonderful Father, in Jesus' glorious name. Thank you, Lord, my God. Amen.